Now, today we're continuing our series called Do Not Disturb. Do Not Disturb. And last week, uh, I kicked it off uh, talking about uh, being too busy and and this trap of being productive. And today, um, I'm actually very excited because I'm actually not going to be preaching today. So uh, I've asked uh, Matt Carlack to preach, and so he is going to be given the word that God has put on his heart. So why don't you guys give a big round of applause for Matt Carlack as he comes up here. And so uh, you guys are in for a ride. Matt, break a leg. Well, not, not literally break a leg, but go for it. <laughs> I'll try not to break a leg. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Carlack, and I want to thank you all for coming today. Um, today I get the very humbling opportunity to preach to all of you. Um, for all of you guys who know me, and if you don't, I've done Royal Rangers for a little bit, so the last time I've actually spoken in front of any group of people was last fall. And uh, it's a little bit different to be up here instead of being out in a field camping with a bunch of guys and boys. So please uh, bear with me, and and I pray for a little bit of grace on that. Uh, Today, like Judah said, we're continuing on our series called Do Not Disturb. And in this series, we're looking into making room for the things that matter in life. Uh, Last week, Judah preached on busyness in our life and how things that keep us busy could keep us from a more meaningful relationship with Jesus Christ. And it was a great sermon. And if you weren't able to to hear it and to see it in person, I would encourage you to go to our Facebook page or our YouTube page, or you could go to our home page and you could find it there, and uh, I would encourage you to listen to it. So today our sermon is on being still before God. And this portion of Scripture is from Psalm 46. And the first part of this verse says, be still and know that I am God. And this is a well-known portion of the verse that goes good on a coffee cup. And I don't know if any of you guys have seen Judah's custom cup that he drinks from on Sunday mornings and on Thursday nights, I think. And it says, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You can actually find a coffee cup or a nice wooden sign with the words, be still and know that I am God on them. And I think this verse is nice to ponder in the morning when we're sitting at peace at the breakfast table and getting ready for the day. It's a powerful verse in its simplicity. And it's something that feels good to think about before the cares of the day come. And when things are quiet and you're sitting on the couch and you got a steaming cup of coffee in front of you, and the cares of the day haven't arrived yet. But I do think that it's difficult to think about when things are difficult, and the storms of life are all around us. And this verse doesn't mean, while it is still, no, I am God. It is much more hopeful, and it is much more powerful than that. And it is good to see God while it is still. It prepares us for the hard times, But this verse is for the hard times. So today we're going to dig into the context of the meaning of the verse in chapter a little bit. 
And we'll go through the Bible, and hopefully we could all, myself included, <laughs> gain an understanding about it and what the psalmist is trying to portray. And the whole of Psalm 46 is meant to put us into a right frame of mind with regard to God's power and how to gain victory in our lives, no matter what situation we're going through. And this is a popular verse in a chapter, and it has been for a very long time. Last week, uh, Judah mentioned Martin Luther and his sermon, so I'm going to do it today too. And Martin Luther used this psalm as a basis for the well-known hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, in Jesus Christ. Finish up with a reference to this psalm in the Sermon on the Mount. So Psalm 46 starts off with a promise to the believer. It says, God is my refuge and God is my strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, and because of this, we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be thrown into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and though the mountains tremble at its swelling. What happens when the ground underneath your feet gives way and you're sitting there gasping for breath and you feel like you're not able to overcome the circumstances that you're in? The storms of life are all around you, and you're just trying to get your head above the water. You may have just received a terrible diagnosis. You may be living with a terrible disease and have great fear about what happens next. Your marriage may be failing or maybe has failed. You could be struggling in your classes in school, and you're not sure what to do next. A close friend of yours may be suffering from addiction and you have no idea how to help. You could be suffering, suffering from addiction and struggling in gaining victory over it. And on top of all that, when we go through difficulty, we typically have to deal with the voices in our head, the ones telling us what a terrible spouse we have, the voices causing us to worry, and they keep us awake at night because of the diagnosis we received or something else. The voice is telling you how unfair life is and why can't things be different? If only you had a better teacher, or why does that person have such a wonderful wife or wonderful husband or parents? And then there are the demons of addiction that want you to fall back into the sin that so easily imprisons you and make you think that it's not so bad to go out and get another drink or to go and take another look, or to go get more drugs. The voice is telling you how right you are and how wrong the others are and cause you to feel great anger and hurt. And some of us struggle with feelings of being unworthy. Some of you may have been abused as a child or an adult, and it's hard to let go and let God heal you. The promise of Psalm 46 is that God is there when we need help. God is there when we are in trouble. When we're going through a battle and difficulty in our life, God is standing there in all his glory and all his might, holding out his hand. And he is always there to help the follower of God. And oftentimes I think that we look at the promise of God written in that psalm, and I'm not sure how, that we have a full understanding of what it says. This is a promise given to the follower of God and to you who put your faith and trust in God. In my paraphrase of Psalm 46, verse 1, and you could jot this down in your notes, and it says, if God is your refuge, God will give you strength, and God will be with you when you go through trouble. The Bible never promises that we will be without trouble, not until we pass on from this body and into the presence of God. Then he will wipe away every tear, and then our troubles will be gone forever. But until that happens, God will be our refuge and strength here on this earth. He will be an ever-present help in trouble, and he can put joy in our hearts by taking our burdens upon himself and making them his own. The Bible says that he will never leave us or forsake us. A follower of God has no need to ever fear during trouble 
or a difficult situation because God is with us. He's in control. He's our fortress, and he's our protection. And many of us, and I count myself as one of them, tend not to see God as all that big. We tend not to go to Jesus Christ when we have trouble in life. Or if we do, we get upset when he doesn't do things in the time or the way we want our prayers answered. We're not sure how to live in the strength of God and wonder why he doesn't hear our prayers. And we wonder why things are so difficult. And I'm saying this humbly as I didn't understand for a very long time what it meant to be a follower of Christ, what it meant to be a Christian. I didn't understand for a long time how to follow God and how to be in Christ and what it means to be a follower of God and a friend of Jesus and not just a believer in him and how truly powerful and trustworthy God is. Now, I'm going to go through a few reasons for the difficulties we have in life. And it's not intended to be a complete list. I have five points on this. But usually, the number one reason why we go through difficulty is this. Reason number one is to humble us before God and to humble us before our fellow man. We tend to be proud people, and maybe you're not, but I was for a very long time. I had a very high opinion of myself, which led to a lot of difficulty in my relationships as I went through life. I was stubborn. I always thought I was right. I would argue. I would ask people for their opinion and then argue with them. I knew how to fix the country. I knew how to fix you. I knew how to fix my wife. I knew what car was best. And on and on. And Judah has preached quite a few messages on this, how God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And when we think we have it together, when we think we're better than other people, what, what, that's when we, when we think we know everything. Watch out. We're to live our lives in constant humble dependence on God and in constant fellowship with him. And if your life is so comfortable that you don't spend time with God and thank him for what he has done and be humble toward other people, you're going to have a storm coming. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. Put that in this morning, so not up there yet. But God may be putting you through a difficult time to save you. And if you profess belief in Jesus Christ, he wants to have fellowship with you. And he wants you to rely on him and be humble as Jesus was humble. We have a wonderful example in Jesus Christ who washed his disciples' feet, who put himself beneath everybody. No one sins so bad that he doesn't offer to save them. And he came to serve everyone. He esteemed everyone better than himself. God, very God. Reason number two for difficulty is to turn us to God. We go astray. We fall into sin. I mentioned pride as the first reason, but it could be all sorts of things. Maybe we turned our back in God. Maybe we grew up in the church and turned away from him in our teenage years or our early 20s. Maybe when we were going to college, or things were going so well in our life that we didn't think we needed God anymore. So God may allow something back into our lives to draw us back to him. And nothing brings to our mind that we need God like difficulty. God's not going to force you to follow him, but he allows us to go the path that we have chosen in life and possibly hit rock bottom so that we can be made new and put our trust in him. Reason three is like reason two and reason one is to release us from sin. Sin blocks us from fellowship with God, and Jesus came to set us free from the bonds of sin and death. 
And only by letting go and letting God cleanse us can we be made new. Then we can become the new creation that God intended us to be. When we release all the things that are holding us back from fellowship with him. And in Hebrews 10, it tells us to be very careful about deliberately sinning after we have come to the knowledge of the truth. We want to make sure we're right with God, and he corrects his children because he loves us, and he wants a relationship with us. And reason four is to create reliance on God. What are the things that we depend on instead of God? The psalm says that though the earth gives way and the mountains be thrown into the midst of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, and though the mountains shake at the swelling of the sea, God is our refuge and our strength. And if we stand on anything other than God, it will give way. Our strongholds will be washed into the midst of the trouble. And they won't be helpful anymore. And Jesus says in Matthew 7, 24 through 27, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does, and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And it's almost as if Jesus was referencing Psalm 46, and I think he was. If we start building on a foundation that's not God, When difficulty comes, those things will be taken away. You can name the foundations that we build on and try to rely on that aren't God. Could be the pursuit of money. Maybe if I get enough money, things will go better in my life. It could be pouring yourself into work. Because people like me at work, and I like work. It could be a whole host of things could be relationships and things that we turn to instead of God, strongholds that we have that can't stand unless they're built on the foundation of God. In God alone is strength and power, and Jesus Christ alone is our Redeemer. And he gives us the fellowship of believers to help us in time of need. But we need to make the individual choice to build on the foundation of Christ, on obeying his commands. So we're ready when the storm comes. And reason number five for difficulties in our life is, I don't know. (laughs) And this isn't a (laughs) cop-out. Sometimes I believe we will not know until we see the Lord or later on in life, when we could look back and see what God has done in us through the trials, and I've brought up my marriage in the past because that's part of my testimony. But I didn't know when we were going through difficulty in our relationship what was going to happen. But I know I could look back and see what God did in my life and how he released me from sin and how he humbled me and how I couldn't have pride in myself anymore. And now I could look back and see what God did in that time. But in that time when I was in the middle of it, I couldn't tell you and didn't know why it was so difficult. I could think of reasons, but they were all wrong. It wasn't my wife that was the problem. Me. (laughs) And I can't pretend to say that I know everything about your situation other than difficulty and blessings fall on the just and on the unjust. There are stories throughout the Bible of people who feel they are righteous, and they're complaining to God because of what they're going through. And Job is one of them, but he's not the only one. All of us are living in the age of grace, and we can be assured that God is in control. And Romans 8, 28 says, 
And we know that God causes all things to work together for good. To those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. If you're going through a struggle, maybe a sickness or a disease, I want to encourage you to keep your eyes on God in this difficult time. And one of the most beautiful things that I could think of is a person who keeps their hope in God and never wavers in spite of what they're going through. And I believe for the sick that God is closer to you than you could ever know any other way. God is watching over you and your family. And what I'm saying is biblical because you are in trouble and he is a very present help. I encourage you to trust in God for healing. Trust in God still if he doesn't. And trust him to take care of what you can't. Back in Psalm 4610, our coffee cup verse, in a whole it says, to be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And how many of you have seen someone struggling in the water? Are there any current former lifeguards out here? And what happens when you think you're drowning? You start flailing your arms and legs. You start reaching out to grab anything you can. You churn up the water and splash and get tired and start to go under. And everything you try to hold on to can't help you. And you end up pushing everything your hands can reach under the water. And there's nothing left for you to stand on. You could throw a drowning person money and it wouldn't do anything. If a person jumped in after you to help, they would get pushed under as well. Things that you normally rely on would be no help. And nothing but a life preserver or a buoy can help you at that time. But you need to be able to stop splashing and struggling to see it. And you could take this illustration and attach it to any of the troubles that you have gone through. If you need help, you need to start with being still. When a person's struggling in the water, sometimes a lifeguard may have to wait until they stop and go underwater because a person who thinks they're drowning can't be reasoned with. And this is for all you who are waiting to help a friend or a child or a parent. And it seems like they won't listen to you. And you're not sure what to do. And they hurt you when you try to help. There's a reason why God lets us hit rock bottom. And for the person who knows they're going through difficulty, what we tend not to realize is that God is there with us. God is big and able to help you in any situation that you're going through. You can't drown God. You could put that in your notes. He could touch the bottom anywhere. The earth is his footstool. And we know he loves us because he already took our sin upon himself before we even knew him. We know he loves us because he already died on the cross for us. And he is willing to help all who come to him. So what does it mean to be still? I have another not very neat list in your notes, and I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Maybe next time I'll do better in that. But it means to stop fighting. <clears throat> and this is in the context of the psalm, to get the Israelites to stop fighting their enemies and their own strength and to rely on God. In Ephesians 6.12, it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against rulers of the darkness of this age and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. You can't do that in your flesh. You can't go up to battle against that in your flesh. When we go to battle against our families, friends, enemies, mother-in-law, father-in-law, Spouse, remember this, our battle is not against them. 
Our battle is not against people. Your fight is against spiritual forces of wickedness around us. And only Jesus Christ can help you there. And there's no power outside of him. Being still means to calm down and know that God is in control. When kids are toddlers and they're throwing a temper tantrum, we tell them to calm down. When we're in the middle of a fight and things are escalating, we need to calm down. In the midst of our trials, we need to know that God is bigger than every problem and could help with everything. And not only can he help, he could calm you down when you go to him and give you peace in the storm. And being still means stop trying so hard to fix things. Many times we want to help God. We're not fighting just to fight, but we have a genuine desire to get into the thick of things and lend a hand or offer our opinion to fix the situation. And in the Old Testament, in 2 Chronicles 20, it says, after Jehoshaphat, who is a king of Judah, found out that a great multitude of people were coming against him in battle, I think four countries coming against him, he fasted and prayed and came to God and said, I'm powerless to protect all these people against this great enemy. And he told God, honestly, God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. And in 2 Chronicles 20, 17, the Lord answered him saying, you will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. God won the battle for Jehoshaphat and his country of Judah by turning their enemies against each other. He took care of it. In Isaiah 52, 12, it says, God will go out before us, and he will be our rear guard. That means that we're protected on all sides by the God who created the universe and created everything. But we tend to go outside God's fortress, fighting our battles, trying to win, and trying to fix things when we need to go to him and ask him for help and wait on him. And being still means to stop worrying. You know, my mother-in-law is a wonderful lady, and I love her very much, but she is a professional worrier. And I'm sure none of you guys are. <laughs> but every time when my, my wife gets off the phone with her, she says, Georgiana, make sure you lock those doors. And when she was younger, I'm not sure if she still does, she told her to watch out for white vans. And she worries. And she does it because she doesn't want anything bad to happen. But God tells us not to worry. And he says in Luke 12, 25, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying about bigger things. We fix our situations by giving them to God and trusting in him. And to be still means to stop rebelling against God. We tend to call it sin, but many times we are in open rebellion against God because we want to do what we know is wrong. And God will never bless something that he's already told us is wrong. Be careful on sins of presumption, which mankind has been doing since the Garden of Eden, presuming that our relationship with God won't be affected when we choose to sin. And I believe if we go to God and we're honest with him and say, Lord, I love this sin, and I like to do that. I want to do what's pleasing to you, Lord, but this thing makes me happy. And I know you say it's wrong, Lord, but I want to do it. 
or I feel like I've been made this way, Lord. And when you go to him honestly and ask for help, God could do wonderful things. And I have no judgment for anybody in this. In the, in the congregation or watching at home, it took me 30 years after I sent the sitter's prayer to have victory in my life and be free. And free in the way that sins that formerly held me down, that I formerly fell into, no longer have power. And I'm not perfect. And I won't be until I leave this earthly body. But to be set free in Christ is a wonderful thing, and he could do it. Now, for our Heavenly Father to give you the keys to the car, and you go out, but because you love God so much, you're not speeding. You're not going places you shouldn't go. You're not doing things with it you shouldn't do. And when God has trust in you, that's Christian freedom. And when you go and you trust in him and you love him so much that you don't want to do the things that he tells us not to do because your relationship with him is so much better than anything else could ever be, that's an awesome place to be. And this goes back to the verse, be still and know I am God. When we go to God honestly and put sin to death, God could take away your appetite for it. And being still also means to wait on the Lord to fix your situation. A popular verse on this, Isaiah 40, 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And right before that verse, it actually says that those who put their, their trust in flesh, you're going to get tired. If you put your trust in man, you're going to get weak. Be patient in Christ, and he will strengthen you. It also means to stop running from your problems and give them to the Lord. I didn't put that on your notes. You could add that there. But when you fight, pick one of your recent fights, family, job, school, work, spouse, parents, whatever they are. Bring your difficulties to God and wait on him to answer. And in this time, no matter how badly you're being mistreated, treat others the way you want to be treated. Even if you're treated badly in return, the golden rule. And you know what? You can't do that. You can't treat people who are treating you badly well without the power of God. In the Bible, it says to overcome evil with good. Don't take revenge. Leave room for God to take care of the situation. And finally, being still means to come to God. Last week, Judah finished the sermon with this verse from Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, and I'm going to read it again. It says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. For the follower of the God of God, rarely will our joy be taken away. Rarely will we fall. And I say rarely because we're still human. We still have the nature we struggle against. We try to go up to the battle without God. But when you put increasing trust in him, he changes your heart. Let God teach you patience and reliance and dependence on him. Read your Bible when you can't fall asleep at night. Yell out to him on your way to work or in private prayer time at home. And let God change you through the difficulty. And if you're not going through anything difficulty and you say to yourself, this sermon isn't for me. This is a call for you to get to know God better. 
to build on a foundation that will never fall. Set aside time and learn from God. Read your Bible and pray to him when it is still, when you have that hot cup of coffee in your hand, so that when trouble does come, you will already have a solid foundation in Christ that will never fall. Our final verse for today is, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord, for he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green and it will not be anxious in a year of drought nor cease to yield fruit. That's for the believer who trusts in God and whose trust is God. Now, I could stand up here and preach today because of what God did in me. I know that God is faithful because he was faithful to me. When I was still before him and stopped trying to fix everything that was going wrong, God changed me. I stand here before you, a man who would never give my trials back because in the time that I went through trials and trouble, I learned to yield to Christ. And the trouble sometimes in our life could become the most fruitful because that's when we learn to rely on God. And I encourage all of you today to put your trust in Jesus Christ. He is faithful. In Acts 4.12 it says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And will you call out to God today? Will you believe that God rose Jesus from the dead? And confess him as your savior. Let's bow our heads, everyone. Heavenly Father, we love you. And Lord, you're so wonderful. You're so awesome, Lord. We know that we're going to go through troubles in life. And I pray, God, that you would help us to be still and know that you are God, that you could take care of us, and that you want to take care of us. And sometimes we go through difficulty in life because of things that we do, and I pray, God, that you would reveal them to us, and we'd stop striving, we'd stop fighting, and go to you. And I pray, Lord, for anyone here who has not given their life to Christ, that they would do so today. Believe in you and confess Jesus as Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.